Yes. So uh, I'm going to talk about two recent papers that uh, I have published with several colleagues. The first one is on uh, small eye movements and are finding that they cannot be reliably measured by current activity-based eye trackers. And the other is a test of a new eye tracker, which we call the EVET1, in which we can measure uh, uh, small eye movements correctly. Hmm. Okay. Um, you should have gotten links to these papers and there are there's a lot of details in the papers that I cannot uh, go through in my talk uh, but I will be more than happy to discuss with them uh, with you afterwards. So uh, before we get into the uh, nitty-gritty about uh, amplitude measurements I wanted to say something about accuracy and precision because when you talk about the quality of data in eye trackers it's always, almost always about accuracy and precision. And it's important that we understand these concepts. So um, accuracy means that if a person that you're recording with your eye tracker is looking at a point, the eye tracker also reports that they are looking at that point as here. The person is looking in the middle and you get data in the middle. If they are looking here and you get data out here, that's an inaccuracy. It's an error in the eye tracker. And we can measure these, these errors. This is a plot from a large study that we did uh, six years ago. And it shows that this eye tracker, the DPI, has the best uh, accuracy, followed by the eye link, followed by a lot of other eye trackers. And we also know that a number of factors affect accuracy. Precision is another concept in data quality measurements. And precision means the noise in the data, the variability in the data points that we get. So this is an imprecise eye tracker. The samples jump around. While this is a very precise, they stay put at the correct place. Uh, precision uh, appears as noise in data. And um, this leads us to um, a finding that we, we and others have done, namely, um, that if you increase the noise in data, small eye movements tend to drown in the noise. And this plot here illustrates that. You take uh, very nice, clean data, you gradually add more and more noise to it. And for each noise level, you run in the same data through an event detector. Then you will find that the number of fixations will drop and the duration of the fixations will um, increase. This depends a little bit on the eye tracker that you're using, but generally this tends to be the case. And the reason is that the small eye movements in between fixations disappear, and the algorithm then thinks that those two fixations are the same, and there are fewer and longer of them. Now, the idea that small eye movements drown in noise is fairly general, and um, when I did this project, I happened to communicate with I.L. Rheingold, who is the owner of the SR research company that produces the iLink eye trackers, which is the one that people prefer to use when they do microscope research and other, uh, should we say, fine research that requires a lot of the eye tracker. And in his email, where I pointed out that there may be amplitude issues, he wrote this, which I think is quite interesting the idea that it's only precision that matters because as the owner of the most prestigious company it may affect design choices in the, in the production of iLink systems. Now uh, amplitude measurements. Uh, I, want to, I want to describe the problem in detail so we understand what it's about. Suppose that the human participants makes a saccade of this size here, uh, 15 minutes of arc, which is a quarter of a degree. If the eye tracker also reports a quarter of a degree, then everything is fine. This, that's what we want. But suppose that the eye tracker would report 20 minutes of arc or 10 minutes of arc, 
for a 15 minute work saccade, then we will have an error. And the error would be the reported amplitude minus the human amplitude. So the question is, do these errors exist? How common are they? And what's the cause of them? And note that it's difficult to know what the human amplitude is. Usually we use an eye tracker to find that out. But if we want to test whether the eye tracker can actually report correct amplitude, then we need to control for the input amplitude. And for this reason, we built a little machine. You can see the machine hiding here behind this eye tracker. It has two shafts sticking up of the roof. On each shaft, you can place an artificial eye. And then the machine rotates the artificial eyes in any step that you like, all the way down to uh, 0.3 arc mean or 20 arc seconds. And uh, this also shows the same machine. Some of the eye trackers like this one, um, the SMI Red 250 Mobile requires a head to be placed around the artificial eye. So we played around with face masks like this, but it's, it's the same machine. Nice. <laughs> Right, so um, we then used artificial eyes, the one we got from SMI, uh, but uh, for DPI we had to use another one because the DPI works differently. Then we uh, programmed rotations uh, in many different ways, but the most common one are staircases. And the staircase means that we first make 10 steps of amplitude one minute of arc. So we go through the, and then we go back, and then we make two minute of arc steps, three minute of arc steps, and so on. Because we want to see it, which amplitudes do the eye tracker, does the eye tracker manage? And we continue with staircases all the way up to 3.2 degrees. So we cover a span from one minute of arc to 3.2 degrees. And we also make a continuous sweeping movement, which will be important later on. Uh, there's always a thousand millisecond stop in between the steps to that makes it easy for the eye tracker uh, and also very clear in data. Uh, we tested the following eye trackers. The DPI, because it's for long been considered one of the very best eye trackers. The iLink 1000 Plus, which is the top model of the SR research company. The iLink 2, which has been the preferred microscard research eye tracker for a long time. The Toby Spectrum, which is the top model of the Toby company, and an eye tracker that I've heard that some people think it can be used for microscard research, and several other eye trackers which are have been used in research. Right. This is what data look like if we plot them. Uh, this is time on the, on the horizontal axis, and here on the vertical axis, it's the horizontal coordinate. And um, these staircase looking uh, patterns here are the steps from the staircase. Uh, and each such step, for, if you take a look at the rightmost staircase, each step here should be 10 minutes of arc and it, each step should be the same. But if we look closely, the steps are not the same. Um, this step here is very much smaller than 10 minutes of arc, and some of the steps here are much longer. Actually, it's quite irregular. But if we instead look across these different staircases, we can see that at the, there is this line here showing a horizontal coordinate for which all the staircases are shrunk at the same direction of the eye. Then there's another uh, horizontal coordinate here where for every staircase the movements are magnified and then again here they are shrunk. Uh, and this produces of course um, amplitude errors and um, um, just because I just want to show this image 
um, recorded with the DPI because I want us all to agree that there, that there are eye movements that are really small. Um, this here is a three argmin microsecard. This is a seven argmin microsecard. So they exist. That's all I want to do with this. Um, so, um, okay, for seven argmin microsecards, what do the different eye trackers do? These are for uh, five, six different eye trackers. The staircase is for seven argmin steps. This is the Eiling 1000, and as we saw before, it sometimes, it sometimes measures correctly, but it often mismeasures like here, uh, or it almost um, removes the, the amplitude completely like here. The DPI largely measures the steps correctly. Uh, this is the Eiling 2, the microsecard eye tracker for people who do video-based microsecard studies. Uh, it records in two different modes, the PCR mode and the pupil-only mode, and um, both uh, have mismeasurements. And these are SMI eye trackers, and uh, yeah, <laughs> they are not good for measuring several ArcMin uh, microscopes. Um, we can now take um, the recorded amplitude, like here for the eye link, and the correct amplitude and subtract one from the other and we get the error. And then we can make big, uh, yeah, we can plot the error like this. Um, in these plots, uh, the horizontal axis is the input amplitude from our stepper box. So it starts at 10 arcmin, which is in the microscard range and then it goes all the way up to 100 arc mean, which is 1.7 degrees. So um, the reading research is typically at this uh, end here, and uh, microscard research is down here. And here are all the eye trackers, and these are the errors. And you can notice that the size of the errors is often, it ranges to more or less the amplitude itself. And the larger the input amplitude, the larger the um, error. Um, but if we take the relative error, that is the error divided by the input amplitude, we notice that the relative error is the largest for the smallest amplitude. So microscope research area. There we have the largest um, uh, amplitude errors while uh, the relative error tends to be smaller. And if you go into reading research, it's like 30, 40% uh, errors at most. All right, uh, you can quantify this in a number of different ways. Um, and um, each of them represent a different type of thinking. But the last table here is, uh, the last column is probably the most useful. It represents the average maximum error over all these amplitudes. And they tend to be around 30%, 40 maybe, of the amplitude, except for the uh, SMI Red 250 mobile, which is the eye tracker in our test that had the largest errors, 80% uh, on, uh, on average. So, um, yeah, uh, you can quantify this in a number of ways. And if you want to look at a specific eye tracker, we have a whole paragraph in the paper that talks about the specific eye trackers and what errors, how common they are in, in different uh, systems. Um, I want to say something about the SMI Red 250 mobile because it's the, an example of the worst possible thing that can happen. Um, these are 20 arc mean rotations of the, oops, of the artificial eye. And um, the blue steps here, they correspond to the rotation of the stepper box, the correct input, 
uh, the correct amplitude. And the signal um, of, that we got from the eye tracker is this one. So it starts here with a leftward eye movement of the amplitude, but the eye tracker reports a rightward movement. For the next leftward movement, we again get a rightward movement, and then it corrects itself. Um, yeah, uh, you don't really want direction reversals in your eye tracker. You don't want a rightward saccade when the person is making a leftward saccade. But in the Red 250 mobile, you can get that. I have been asked to say something about what this means for uh, research, and I selected the binocular micro saccades as a case. Um, uh, binocular microscopes are important because if all microscopes are binocular, then it probably means that they are driven by um, the sites in the brain responsible for driving saccades. But if they are monocular, that's if, if microscopes happen in only one eye, then it could be the motor systems that are closer to the eye that do this. So it's theoretically important. There are uh, reports of monocular microscopes from studies that use video-based uh, PCR eye trackers. But what I think happens there is that um, if a human makes two equally sized microscopes, then the eye tracker misrepresents the amplitude, it shrinks it for one eye and magnifies it for the other eye. And if you put then an amplitude for detection, it only detects one and the other goes under the radar and you have artificially a monocular microscope. Um, interestingly, with DPIs and coils, uh, people have never found uh, monocular microscopes. So the question is, why does this happen? Um, we don't really know, but we know this. Uh, the errors repeat periodically. Uh, or we were very surprised when we saw this, but we noticed that the errors repeat uh, periodically. So there's first a period of shrinkage, then of magnification, shrinkage, magnification, and we can even uh, approximate a wavelength of how, how this changes of the measurement space. And here are the wavelengths for the different um, eye trackers. And if you know how eye trackers work and how calibration works, the first thing you think about when you notice that there is a sinusoidal periodicity in the data is calibration functions, because they are polynomial. And polynomials are known to be um, you know, sinusoidal. Um, no, not really sinusoidal, but they have this ups and down mean. I mean right. So it is quite possible that in a polynomial that has this shape, a magnification happens at one top and the shrinkage happens at the bottom. Uh, but after careful thinking, I don't think that polynomials have anything to do with it. Uh, and the reasons are noted here. Calibrations were linear in all of the management space. We have a table in the paper showing this. Uh, changing the number of calibration points means changing the mathematics of the calibration did not affect the amplitude errors. Uh, calibration polynomials of, of order five to six, but we find 30 or more alterations of the monitor space, which is not consistent. Uh, and some Tobis do not use polynomial calibration, so they say, and they still have amplitude errors. So it's probably not the polynomials. Then we plotted this, and I think this was the key to understanding what's going on. Um, Video-based PCR eye trackers, they have a, a camera that films the eye, and they identify two features in the eye, the pupil, or the center of the pupil, and the reflection in the cornea, which is the white here, and the center of that reflection. And from these two features, it calculates gaze. Now, if there's a mismeasurement in any of the features, there will be a mismeasurement in gaze. 
So we took the smooth um, data that we collected when, when the artificial eyes just moved smoothly across the monitor, like here, and we plotted them over time. So this is time and this is uh, horizontal degrees. And we noted that the pupil signal, which corresponds to the center of the pupil here in the eye image, is largely smooth. While the CR signal, which corresponds to the center of this reflection here, is irregular. So there's something going on with the CR. So if you look at the um, eye camera of the eye of an SMI or an SR research eye tracker, then the pupil diameter is typically 50 to 100 camera pixels. While the diameter of the corner reflection is 8 to 12 camera pixels. Now, if you rotate an artificial eye or a human eye, 10 arc min, how much do you think that the CR moves in the eye camera? How many pixels would you think? Because we could do that. We could also, we could do that. Take our separate box and, and rotate it and then measure in the, in the camera image. So here are data from this at the bottom here. Uh, these are 10 steps, each of uh, amplitude 10 arc min. And uh, this represents the, uh, amp the size that we took of the movement of the CR center in camera pixels. Uh, it, it starts off, it's about 0 0.03 pixels. That's about one thirtieth of a camera pixel. And then suddenly it makes a big error here and it's 0 0.2. I think that's when the irregularities happen. And then it corrects itself somewhat and it's about 0 0.06. But it's certainly not the same all the time. It's not a flat line here. Now, I think there is something happening with the calculation of the uh, center of the corner reflection, and that's what's causing the error. Um, here we have a zoomed in version of the corner reflection of um, the SMI high speed 240. Uh, there is exactly a 10 minute of arc rotation between those two images. And if you look very, very, very closely, you can see that there are small shade differences between these. But does it correspond to one twentieth of a pixel? The algorithm that does this, does this estimation of the center and is responsible for calculating how large the movement is between these two reflections is called a sub-pixel estimation algorithm. The most common one is called um, center of mass. I think this is where the problem is. Um, Subpixel estimation is not easy and it's even more difficult with human eyes. So here is a um, uh, eye image of a, a person who has a very interesting pattern in the iris. This is common with people who have a background in, in Africa, uh, genetics from Africa, they often have this. And if you look closely at the corner reflection, it looks like this. It's not even round, it's like oblong here. Suppose that this person makes a 10 arc min saccade. How would the interaction be between the reflection and this pattern? That cannot help uh, making the, making, it difficult for the subpixel estimation to make the same assessment of the rotation, irrespective of where the corner reflection lands on this uh, background pattern. So, uh, once I had these results, I talked with the manufacturers, and um, SR Research built their own stepper box and replicated the amplitude errors. So um, they said 
it's most likely subpixel estimation and they want to fix it. Uh, Toby borrowed our stepper box and they also said it's a pixel estimation and they are looking for ways to fix it. But interestingly also Toby said they're not sure if it's, it can be fixed without affecting other properties such as precision. And I'm not even sure that it can be fixed as such. I think the problem is really difficult. So the summary of paper one. Um, PCR eye trackers, the video eye trackers, which dominate the eye tracking market completely, have issues with both their features. Uh, there's one artifact that is really well known, the pupil artifact, which has often been reported, uh, which results in sizable inaccuracies when the pupil constricts and dilates. We'll see more about that when I talk about paper two. And then there's the CR artifact, which has never been reported before, which results in sizable mismeasurements of small saccard. Now, paper two. Um, I am working with a company, an Israeli company, and uh, several of them are listening in here, I've noticed. And uh, yeah, hi, Mark. <laughs> and um, they have built a really, really interesting eye tracker. So we wanted to test it and see, does it um, match up with the DPI? Because if, well, I were, if it was correct, what I said in the previous paper, then you shouldn't use video-based eye trackers for small saccades and everyone should use the DPI. But the DPI is really old. It's from, it was built in 1973 at first and it still looks like it's from 1973 with old-fashioned electronics. It needs to be tuned uh, at least once a year. It's difficult to learn how to operate it. So if there could be an eye tracker that is as good as the DPI, it would benefit the research community a lot, I think. That's not their main focus. They want to build an augmented reality system, but they need this very good eye tracker for it. But I think we should have that very good eye tracker in the research community too. So that's my motivation for, uh, for this paper and for working with them. Um, so what we did, we took a number of participants, uh, we made a within suffix design and we tested these eye trackers. Their eye tracker, the EVT1, which runs at 120 and 4000 hertz, standalone. Then we combined it with the DPI, so we co-record the same eye with both eye trackers. And we also recorded on the Toby spectrum at 600 hertz and uh, the DPI standalone at 4000 hertz. And uh, the room conditions were dark, soundproofs, and we made sure that there were no vibrations. So the EVT1 eye tracker is a hybrid system. It combines the signals from an optoelectronic MEMS based tracker of corneal reflection which we call the CR signal at 4,000 Hertz. Notice that this CR signal is not from a camera. So there are no pixels here. It's analog, like in the DPI. And a dual camera based uh, eye tracker of 3D translational movements of the eye and head relative to the device, which we call the TR signal at 120 Hertz. And from these two sensor signals, you can calculate the direction of the optical axis, the gaze signal at 4,000 Hertz. And exactly how that is done is not really important here. Now, uh, this test was done in November 2019 and the prototype that we tested looked like in the image here. There is a bite bar because we wanted to control for um, head movements and things. This is not what the end product will look like, um, but the principle, the measurement principle is the same. So we tested uh, a number of experiments here. Uh, I'm going to report a five times five grid for precision accurate testing, a long fixation for tremor and microscards, what happens if we vary luminance for the pupil size effect on gaze, which um, we know about from other studies. We also did a rhombus test uh, with, with fast uh, oblique saccades to look at saccade dynamics, and we had a four second 
uh, rest period between trials. Now, um, the first test is one of accuracy and precision, which are the most commonly reported measures. And just to remind you, accuracy is the uh, distance from the recording to the point where the person is looking, this error here, while precision is the noise in the data, how much it jumps around. Right, so uh, precision uh, is to the left. Uh, uh, these are density histograms of all the samples. At the bottom, you see the precision values in a log scale. And uh, here are the, uh, yeah, the, oops, the proportions, the proportions on the, on the left. And we can see that um, if we start from the spectrum, it has a precision of about 0 0.08 degrees, which is also what they report in their, uh, in their manufacturer slides. Uh, the DPI is about one order of magnitude better, which we also know from earlier uh, recordings with the DPI. And uh, the EVT CR signal is about one order of magnitude better than the DPI, which is really encouraging. In the combined signal, when they combine the two signals, the noise is comparable to the DPI. To the right, we see the accuracy values recorded. Um, the spectrum does uh, well, and the two other eye trackers also does reasonably okay. Uh, these are typical accuracy values. Uh, I would have hoped that the EVT eye tracker would be better, and the reason that it's not so much better here is that uh, iWay still doesn't have a good calibration algorithm. When that happens, I think, uh, the plot will look better. Uh, we then took the long fixation uh, condition and manually uh, detected saccades, uh, uh, micro saccades in that data. We chose to do that manually because we didn't trust the uh, micro saccade algorithms to be fair when they compared three entirely different eye trackers. And um, uh, this again is a, uh, uh, yeah, let me first say, uh, we detected about twice as many uh, microsecards in the DPI and the I-Way signal compared to the Toby signal, which is consistent with the uh, idea that precision is important for, for microsecard detection. But interestingly, in this uh, density histogram, we can also see that uh, the EVT and the DPI find lots of really small microscards, uh, which the TOPI does not see. And in fact, the whole distribution of microscard uh, amplitudes in the TOPI spectrum is shifted right to longer microscards. And this is something that has been um, discussed in the microscope literature before. The question, why have the microscopes become longer when we record with video-based eye trackers? And I think precision is not the only reason. I think the mismeasurements of the CR is a contributing uh, case. Uh, we also looked at tremor, and we could see uh, tremor in um, in the EVTR and the uh, EVT CR signal and the DPI signal. But uh, yeah, it needs further uh, further investigations before we are uh, really sure about it. Uh, then we took the stepper box and uh, from the previous paper and we ran it on some of these eye trackers as well. So these rotations are two minutes of arc, one thirtieth of a degree. And for the EVT, yeah, it seems to do that nicely. The DPI also does this nicely. Uh, all the are correctly measured. The iLink 1000 Plus, um, well, 
you can't really see the steps of two minutes of arc in, in I-linked data. And for the total spectrum, yeah, you can't even see the general tendency. So uh, the EVT for microscale detection is definitely a par, on par with the DPI and definitely better than the video-based eye trackers that people use for microscale detection or pl plan to use for microscale detection. Um, we also investigated the effect of variations in luminance on the signal. Uh, this is important for research, but it's even more important if you build this eye tracker into an augmented reality uh, headset where people walk from a dark room until a very bright room. And the reason that it's important is the effect of the pupil diameter on gaze. So what we did is we had people look in the middle of the monitor and then we varied the luminance sinusoidally from really dark until really bright. It's sort of painful to look at this, but they, um, our participants, did their very best to keep their uh, gaze locked at the fixation cross. So here is the um, uh, the gray uh, the gray uh, plot. Here is the luminance, and the dark is the pupil diameter as measured by the Tobit spectrum for each of the participants, and it varies really nicely here between two millimeters and up to around five millimeters. At the top, uh, the pink is the, um, uh, is the luminance change and the dark is the gaze of all these participants. And you can again see that the gaze follows uh, luminance really nicely um, as expected and it varies across around two degrees from the bottom here until it, to, the, to this side. So it shifts in space two degrees back and forth as we change luminance. Now, this is not good if it's a augmented reality headset, but it's also not good if it's um, research. We then took uh, all these um, gaze and correlated it to the luminance signal. And then we got these um, correlation plots here. And we can see that the TOBI and the DPI both are affected by uh, the luminance and the highway eye tracker. The horizontal signal is hardly affected at all. The uh, vertical signal is slightly more. But compared with these eye trackers, I, our conclusion is that the eye, eye tracker is unaffected. And the reason, of course, is that it doesn't care about the pupil. It doesn't use the pupil at all. So. Um, we made this uh, uh, rhombus tests uh, to look at saccade dynamics and post saccade oscillations. And, um, uh, here is the same participant uh, at the uh, eye eye tracker, the TPI, and the Toby spectrum. Uh, their task was to look around in the rhombus like this fairly quickly. And we know from before that this generates saccadic curvature and large uh, post saccadic oscillations, uh, which we can see um, um, in the TPI, of course. These are nicely curved uh, saccades here on this side. Uh, lots of post saccadic oscillations on this side and here. But it, also in the Toby, there are sizable post saccadic oscillations here. There's a bit of curvature here. And this is the eyeway uh, gaze, the hybrid signal. It uh, does a decent job as well. So here is the draw in this particular task. Well, yeah. So, Mm, we then thought um, within Sabix is fine, but what you really want is you want to co record uh, the same eye with the two eye trackers to make sure that it's, um, it, the signals are the same. So, what my colleagues um, uh, from Highway did, they took their own sensor and they built it 
on top of the DPI in this construction that you can see here at the top. So the sensor comes from above in this mirror and reflects to the eye here, but they must at the same time give space for the signal from the DPI to come from this end so we could record both data. It was really, really difficult to do this and we made three attempts before we could make this work. And here are the data. Um, uh, I will show a few different things. First, in the rhombus task, this is the CR signal of the uh, eye eye tracker. It has large dynamic overshoots. Um, this is DPI for the same eye, a similar type of overshoots like the CR signal from the eye way eye tracker. Uh, the translational component does not have any of that and the gaze uh, signal also not. If we look at single saccades to the right, um, it's the DPI in blue, the IYCR in red. They are concurrent, but they are shifted in, in time a little bit for visibility only. Uh, you can see again that the saccade dynamics, the overshoots of the CR of the EBT is, um, is larger even than the DPI. And here again for the uh, vertical component, it's even huge. And yeah, that's something that may need to be tuned. I'm not sure. But what was really a, a big success with the DPI is the translation signal. You may not know it, but the DPI outputs its own translation signal, which represents lateral head movements of the participant. Right. And the eye eye tracker also has a lateral measurement uh, from the video based attractors. So we took the translational signal from the DPI here in dark green and the translational component from the highway and they match really nicely. Uh, this last one here is the uh, translation in depth which the uh, DPI doesn't measure but the highway does. So translation works really nicely. So uh, my discussion about paper two is what we found is uh, in the eye way, eye tracker one, superior resolution uh, and precision compared to video based eye trackers and definitely on par with the DPI, uh, but not accuracy, which will have to be solved further on. Comparable population coverage, uh, largely negligible data loss with a few exceptions. There's no effect on gaze of background luminance and pupil size, which is really nice. Uh, smaller but visible post saccadic oscillations, which is true in the combined gaze signal, but not in the CR signal. Detectable tremor, yes, we can see it, it needs further investigations and translational eye movements tracked on par with the DPI. So uh, general conclusions from the two papers are just presented. For recording small eye movements, reading microscards, if the scar amplitudes are important, it's not a good idea to use a PCR video-based eye tracker. Use a DPI or a version of the highway eye tracker. And I also think the highway eye tracker could become a great uh, eye tracker for use in augmented reality with some further development. So finally, a big thanks to a lot of people who have helped uh, us with this. Uh, first, Barry Krause and Mark Johnson who built the um, uh, stepper box for us. Uh, a lot of people have lent us eye trackers or helped with validation in the, um, of the stepper box. Uh, some Hutton at SR Research very generously lent us a lens for the eye link so we could test if, if we change the lens, does it have an effect on the eye movement? Uh, we've got a lot of good feedback from people on earlier versions of these uh, papers. So, thank you. I think we could stop the recording.